Hello uh, and welcome again to another of the Nautical Institute's technical webinars. Uh, this is a very special one and we'll explain why. Uh, my name is David Petreko. I am with the Nautical Institute headquarters staff in London and I am so thrilled to be joined here by this fantastic uh, uh, group of professionals, navigators. So hello everybody. And David. <laughs> But right. before we start, I hope everybody's familiar with the Nautical Institute, but if not, we are an international professional body. Our main role as a professional body is to help our members develop themselves professionally. And we do that through publications, through events, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we also represent our members in the industry. And we do that at forum like the IMO, where we have NGO status, at IALA and various other organizations. And the reason we do this is because we like to share information. Uh, professionals from around the world, every rank, whether they're on board or whether they're ashore, continually update themselves with information. And by sharing that information with each other, we make better decisions. And that's what it's all about. Now, those better decisions might be for safety, they might be commercial operations, or they might be your personal development, but it's about sharing information. And all the people here today are here to help share information with you. And of course, we want to hear your information to share as well. So the subject of watch keeping is enormously important to us at the Nautical Institute. So we're really thrilled to have this opportunity and to have all you joining us. This is an interactive event. Uh, although your microphones and cameras will not work, you can write in questions. So if you have a question, uh, you have a little control panel up in the upper right hand uh, side of your screen. There's a field here to type a question and please don't forget to press the send button and they will come to me. Uh, there are also some handouts or downloads that you can see. Uh, we have uh, the slides that uh, Captain Bull will uh, uh, give. Uh, we have a, a special offer and some other documents that you might find useful. Now, uh, when the webinar is over and we will finish promptly in an hour's time, uh, there'll be a little pop-up quiz asking how we did. And I ask you to uh, uh, participate with that because it helps us uh, learn and make better offerings in the future. In a, about a few hours, you will receive an email saying thank you very much for attending. And there will be a personalized CPD certificate there for you. And you're very welcome for that. Uh, this is being recorded and a recording will be available on our YouTube channel. So feel free to rewatch uh, if you've missed anything and feel free to share that with your friends and colleagues. You are not alone. There are nearly 13 or probably over 1300 of you out there uh, at the moment. So when you do write in questions, please keep them as succinct as possible and we'll try to get to as many as possible. But thank you all for your interest. It is now my pleasure to introduce your moderator, our CEO of the Nautical Institute, Captain John Lloyd, FNI. John, over to you. Uh, David, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to all of the panelists for, for joining us. Um, and thank you to uh, the whole of the world for showing so much interest and in registering for the session today uh, on bridge watchkeeping. Fundamental, as David said, to, to our profession. Um, but Anyway, let's get straight down to business, and it's a great pleasure for me to uh, to introduce our first speaker, uh, Captain uh, Kuba Samansky, Secretary General uh, of Intermanager, uh, the International Trade Association for the Ship and Crew Management Sector. Uh, Kuba started his career in, in 1985 and graduated from the Maritime University of Chechen with a master's degree before starting his deck officer career. Uh, he also has qualification from the Lloyds Academy um, and an MBA from um, Liverpool John Moores University, uh, uh, in the, the Isle of Man and so on. So hugely well qualified. He, he has an honorary doctorate from Southampton Solent University in recognition for his contribution to the maritime industry. And of course, Cuba still goes to sea wherever he can and is a very keen yachtsman um, and is currently um, uh, close to or on board uh, his, his own uh, sailing vessel as well. Kuba, we're, we're looking forward to to your insights. Um, and, and when I disappear, I'd invite the other panelists just to uh, turn their cameras off for the time being. And Kuba, over to you. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. And uh, 
extremely honored actually to be uh, available today and to give you a forward. I'm just puzzled because I seem to be frozen. David, can you hear me and am I live? Uh, we can hear you, Kuba. You keep uh, you keep Very talking. Good. Okay. What a book. When I received this book a few days ago, I was thinking, um, Mark has done a superb job and the audiences, who this book is for. And I've checked, would that book be good for cadets? Definitely. Junior officers, superb. Masters, absolutely. And then what about the office people? Hmm. I've checked it. I went through and I thought, amazingly good book for us as well. So how about investigators? Would they learn anything from this book? Absolutely. And especially when I was reading forward by my close friend, Yves Vanderborn, it struck me, it struck me again, that we in shipping industry are still in a blame game. We really want to blame our seafarers. Mark is very far from that. In his book, Mark is not venturing into that as far as I'm concerned. And I hope I'm not reading between the lines. Mark is providing very good accounts of a lot of things and thinking that this is the environment we humans being, human beings are working in. So if this environment is difficult, if this environment is faulty, if it's unsafe, how can we then perform safely? What am I talking about? I'm talking about alarms, for example. My recent ship, I went there, and here we go. Without second mate who was on board already, I wouldn't discover which alarm was there. And thanks God it was only somebody's mobile phone charging in a corner. Anecdotal, yes, indeed. But why don't we have a standard? And why do we always expect human being to perform superbly in a very complicated environment? No doubt Dominic later will come today and will be talking to us about accidents, especially during watchkeeping. This book is really good for that. I enjoyed looking at workload. You would guys remember that Intermanager and myself included were very much into the Marta project when we were checking fatigue on board. Mark has not forgotten about that. Mark is telling us about the workload and telling us that sometimes you might be over the limit and you need to recognize that and you need to shout for help. Another item which I really like in this book is advice from Mark telling us do not get distracted. How easy is that to say? Everything is usually under enormous time pressure. Does it have to be? Well, it's up to us, very often is. And how not to get distracted? And now I will appeal to your own experience. Have you been to Singapore recently? When you've got a pilot who comes with his mobile phone, his own VHF, you are listening on one VHF to one station, on the other to another, and the pilot is talking Chinese. How not to get distracted? You really need to be very, very focused. Okay, you may say Singapore is very far away. Well, let's move to Rotterdam. Pilot comes on board and he doesn't speak English with you. He talks, well, with you he does, but he doesn't speak with tugboat and boat lines and other men in English. They all speak their own Dutch and then they transfer to us. How does this relate to the book? Well, there is a paragraph on that as well. Now, Mark, I would like to thank you. Thank you profoundly for this book. It's excellent. I took a lot of out of it. I have some questions for you as well. I'll take it offline because there are some abbreviations I didn't understand. I Googled them and I still don't know what they are talking about. But that's good because it's thought provoking, but it's also providing an excellent background for anybody throughout the industry. John, that's all from me. Thank you. Uh, Kuba, thank you very much indeed for those opening remarks. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we, we look forward to hearing from Mark a little bit later on as well. Um, for our next speaker, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Captain Dominic Bell, uh, a master mariner with command experience who, who joined Brooks Bell in January of 2020 from his position um, as Marine Manager at Sea Trap Ferries. Um, he's extensive experience in, in command with the, the Isle of Man Steam Packet company and then 20 years seagoing experience on a whole variety of ships from uh, high-speed passenger vessels, uh, naval auxiliaries and so on, uh, experience as designated person ashore, company security officer and crisis manager with extensive pilotage and ship handling experience on, on these different ship types. Um, for his presentation today we're going to learn a little bit about um, Dominic's um, 
experience as a, as a forensic analysis of navigational incidents uh, and, we, and we look forward to, to learning about those Dominic thank you Dominic is an associate fellow of the Nautical Institute um, an associate fellow of the Royal Institute of Navigation and a Freeman of the Honourable Company of Master Mariners uh, Dominic um, over to you and thanks for joining us thanks John and uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen so uh, as John says um, I'm a Master Mariner with uh, Brooks Bell um just get this slide to work and um, so uh, a little bit about myself uh, i've at sea for 20 years uh, with the royal flight auxiliary and isle of man steam packet from uh, cadet to uh, master a year and a half as a, a humber pilot and then uh, latterly 12 years as a marine manager joined uh, brooks bell uh, january last year and i've since investigated uh, a variety of uh, matters including cargo losses uh, performance disputes and pilot boarding arrangements but my sort of current key role at the moment is as a casualty, a casualty investigator including analysis of VDR and other data and production of MADAS and MSG perspectives. So um, what I'm going to try and do is sort of link what we investigate to bridge watchkeeping uh, at the end. So Brooks Bell, uh, founded in 1903, we're a, a leading multidisciplinary uh, technical uh, consultancy serving the uh, marine and energy, energy sectors. Uh, we investigate, we troubleshoot, and we advise on a variety of matters, including casualty investigation, uh, and we provide technical dispute resolution and expert witness work. We have a global reach, UK, uh, Asia, Singapore, Hong Kong, and uh, Shanghai, and also now in Houston. So drilling down a little bit into what I'm uh, in, uh, involved with is casualty investigation. So worldwide, we've got a team of 20 master mariners with a, a huge range of experience. Um, our approach to casualty investigation is uh, forensic. We go into absolutely everything, and we've got a variety of tools and methods to achieve that. So we've got the old-fashioned attendance, interview, uh, a collection of uh, physical data and evidence, preservation of that evidence, and then we review that documentary evidence. But more recently, with VDR and AIS, uh, we also analyse in great depth uh, through MADAS and uh, MSG Prospector. So I mentioned MADAS a couple of times now. Those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, MADAS uh, stands for Marine Accident Data Analysis Suite. Um, it was produced by Avenka, uh, who are a, a world-leading uh, supplier of data analysis software based in the UK. Um, it was conceived by them uh, and primarily for the MEIB in the UK and the NTSB in the USA to meet their uh, casualty uh, investigation requirements. And basically, uh, MADAS fuses together many different types of uh, digital data from different sources, VDR, ECDIS, AIS, uh, to form a complete picture of a, a particular incident. The data that we get is plotted onto a chart and then that's synchronized with the audio from the VDR. So we can have multiple ships and multiple audio and we can display various things, uh, radar, ECDIS images and various gauges. Unfortunately, the nature of the VDR data that we receive means that we can't necessarily um, demonstrate it. So I was very kindly supplied with um, data from a couple of uh, non-casualty um, uh, arrivals of two ferries, one from the Isle of Man steam packet, which is the high-speed craft Mananen, and one from Northlink ferries, the uh, Horossi. And I've just got a couple of uh, MADAS demonstrations to show you. This is a very simple uh, MADAS uh, replay showing the Mananen um, arriving from uh, the Isle of Man in Tahitian which is not a million miles from where I'm sat at the moment. Uh, this is very basic, it's at times five speed. And what we've got is the ship, based on the GPS data supplied into the VDR, uh, turning in the harbour with a 30 second footprint left behind it to show us where the ship was. But basic uh, latitude, longitude, and uh, other basic navigational details. The chart is electronic, um, and this is from MSG, who I'll explain a little bit more about uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, this, uh, we had uh, good um, uh, radar and ECDIS images coming through on this particular replay. So we've got uh, radar top right and uh, ECDIS bottom right. And that's our approach in the berth. So 
So this uh, second one, this is the Horossi, which is a rope axe um, uh, coming into Aberdeen. The purpose of this uh, is to show you how we can integrate video into a Madas replay. Again, the replay is a very basic replay onto an electronic chart. But this shows you uh, that we can, and this is a very useful tool for us, is to show um, either this is mobile phone footage or CCTV footage of any particular incident. And then we go on to AIS. Um, this is something we've started using um, a lot more more recently, um, MSG Prospector. AIS, as you'll know, is uh, Automatic Identification System. Um, we have started using it because of its, uh, it's extremely convenient for us to get um, a very quick preliminary overview of any particular uh, incident. The uh, software we use is MaySmart from MaySmart Group, MSG, and they're a, a Dutch company. And they've got a, an enormous database of AIS uh, data, 230,000 vessels, uh, and that goes back in some cases to uh, 2005. And we can filter that data uh, by area, by time, by types of vessels. Um, and again, we can perform replays, and we can usually within um, three or four hours of any particular notification of a casualty, we can provide the client with uh, a good overview of what may or may not happen in that incident. So this is an example of um, an MSG um, replay. Uh, we've got two vessels here, <clears throat> uh, both at anchor. This is a, a case a colleague was dealing with a couple of years ago. Uh, and basically, this is at times 500, by the way. They weren't moving around that quickly. Uh, and basically, this is a good example of um, poor uh, lookout. Uh, the officer of the watch on the blue ship um, was engaged in a video call with someone off the ship, uh, and that call went on for over 40 minutes, and he wasn't aware that the green ship was starting to drag towards him, and ultimately the green ship, uh, the lookout on that was uh, particularly poor as well. And unfortunately, there was a collision uh, followed by a grounding. Uh, something that's uh, a more recent thing, and it's, uh, one of my colleagues has specialised in this, is uh, um, uh, incidents involving ECDIS. Uh, and this comes down to the findings that uh, we're coming up with is the insufficient familiarisation and understanding of ECDIS, um, making assumptions that uh, where there's no ENC coverage, there's deep water, which when clear there isn't. Um, poorly uh, handled within the safety management system, which tend to be uh, mainly written for paper charts and uh, you'll notice the bottom one there which is not cross-referencing ECDIS boy positions with radar and visual which is a key theme with many of our uh, findings in that uh, it's electronic equipment technology not being cross-referenced. So this is my final slide and this is where we this isn't um, uh, an exhaustive uh, list of uh, casualty findings but this is where there's some handy ones that I'd like to sort of highlight, uh, which link into bridge watch keeping. So uh, the top one, uh, situational awareness, which is, covers a multitude of things, uh, but lack of compliance with lookout rule five, uh, watch keepers falling asleep, not maintaining a proper visual lookout, and uh, watch keepers glued to the actus and over-reliance on technology. Um, we quite often find poor passage planning, um, not properly appraising an intended passage, and particularly where there's a deviation from that passage, uh, not taking into account dynamic draft through squat, and not taking account of environmental effects on predicted tides. Obviously, both of those two lead into groundings. And then not adequately monitoring the execution of the passage, not parallel indexing and the like. And uh, a few other little items that we keep coming up, um, lack or inadequate training and experience, uh, non-existent or inadequate uh, master pilot information exchange, bridge teams not challenging the master when they don't, when they think that he may have made a mistake. And the old chestnut right at the bottom there is assumptions shall not be made on the basis of scanty information, as we all said.
And that concludes my uh, presentation. Thank you, John. Uh, Dominic, thank you very much indeed. So uh, interesting to see how technologies can be brought together in, in the analysis. And thank you for the for the insight in, into that. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, well, it's now my great pleasure to to introduce um, Captain Mark Bull, a fellow of the Nautical Institute, who started a seagoing career in 1970 with the P and O Steam Navigation Company, um, and ten years later. Um, his Master Mariner's Certificate of Competency, um, and, and 10 years after that was promoted to Master. So extensive sea service uh, spanning 27 years with a, with a variety of um, shipping companies and extensive uh, command uh, experience as well. So there's nobody um, who we could draw upon to help us more um, to lead a number of uh, activities at the Nautical Institute, um, as well as being a fellow uh, Mark is a member of our council um, and a member of the technical committee, uh, made a significant contribution to um, the, the navigation assessments publication um, and was the lead in establishing our, our own navigation assessor training. So it's a great pleasure, uh, Mark, to welcome you today and uh, thank you um, for, for the words you're about to share with us. <laughs> thank you, John. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Buenos dias, buenas tardes, bonjour, bonsoir. Um, next slide, please, uh, <clears throat> David. Good. Right. Um, so, <clears throat> the background to <clears throat> the Bridge Watch Keeping publication. Bridge Watch Keeping lies at the heart of safe navigation. And it is the breakdown of the application of many first principles that lead to so many incidents. Amongst these are lookout, margins of safety, and monitoring the passage plan. Incident investigations reveal many of these failures, but how an error chain can develop may be seen during navigation assessments. During my time carrying out navigation assessment, I made several key findings. Primarily, the off to the watches were very loyal to the company system. Many first principles, however, were being omitted and probably unknown. Off to the watch were being set impossible objectives and confusion was being caused by external inspectors and auditors. In the late 1980s, I took a sabbatical. I trained and qualified and practiced as a teacher of English as a foreign language. During our initial training, it was demonstrated that you cannot expect someone to speak a new language if they have never heard it before. And similarly, you cannot expect someone to write that language if they have never read it before. Could it be then that after the watches, had never been shown how to some, do some of these first principles properly. Many company procedures spell out in detail what an officer of the watch must do, for example, on pilotage. <clears throat> but in practice, to do all of these, in many cases, is impossible. To highlight that, a junior officer is very unlikely to speak up and challenge the master because of their difference in rank. And also there are conflicting margins of safety. Do I comply with the closest point of approach requirements or with the cross track limit set on ECDIS? Many times when interviewing the officer of the watch, post watch and asking them why they did a particular activity, the repetitive answer I received was because the vetting inspector wants it this way. You cannot expect anyone to perform old tricks on new equipment, nor should, because we have always done it this way, be the answer to why. The outcome. <clears throat> Incident investigations result in lessons to be learnt, the solution. Navigation assessment findings really re reveal something else, and as a loss prevention tool, they are limited to individual ships and companies. There have been many changes in watchkeeping practices, some large and some very subtle, since the last bridge watchkeeping publication was uh, brought about by new equipment, design and inspection. 
not all those changes to practices were positive. So the time had arrived to write the new edition, take into account those changes. And I felt it was not only my duty, but responsibility to do that as a fellow of the Nautical Institute and a member of council. Now, as the first language of the majority of officers of the watch is, is not English, the book has been written in simple terms to afford understanding. It follows a first trip officer of the watch from home to arrival on board, familiarization, the first principles of watch keeping, testing and using equipment to carrying out the watch keeping itself. <clears throat> Here is the cover of the new publication. And the new edition incorporates never relying on a single source of information. Next slide, please, David. An in-depth explanation of lookout, what each system can and cannot do. Next slide, David. Visual lookout. I also refer to how many pairs of binoculars you should find on the average ship. This is a copy. Of, uh, next slide, David. <clears throat> this is a copy of the table showing the capabilities of each type of lookout. And the next slide, please. The next slide shows the limitations of each lookout system. So by combining the two, we can find whether the systems that are currently in use will satisfy the need of keeping a good lookout at any time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but <clears throat> procedures, etc., is not enough. We must realize that the health and well-being of the individual watchkeeper is paramount to keeping a safe navigation watch. Margins of safety. We frequently discuss margins of safety. We do not take into consideration whether they are achievable at all times. That is dealt with again in the book. Using new instrumentation properly, and of course we refer here to AIS and ECTIS. Position fixing, position fixing interval, position verification fixing, and using two independent systems simultaneously are again described in the book. And next slide. Now it is very difficult when you're sailing around doing assessments to get some really good samples of how this equipment can be used. And this is from a Cape sized bulk carrier entering the Dardanelles. And from this system, we can see four possible forms of fixing the ship's position. First of all, the big black uh, dot to the left of center is own ship's position at the time provided by GNSS. And behind the ship, we can see the previous uh, positions uh, set intervals. <clears throat> On the land, you can see this uh, deep, uh, darker orange coloring, which is the radar overlay. And then you can see in blue hatched line is, are the um, data for the parallel indexing, which is taken from the ECDIS and then displayed on the ARPA. So we have two displays side by side, giving the ship's position continuously through this particular section. And finally, of course, we can use the uh, EBL and VRM to take bearings and distances from key points ashore. And to verify this, when this lighthouse that is shown in, in the center comes a beam, we can do a quick verification fix to confirm the information we are getting from the GNSS and how it compares with the visual and radar fix. Next slide, please, David. <clears throat> now, new developments are, are quite interesting. We all know that communication is the number of links or stages between the transmitter and receiver can increase the chance of errors. 
The classic example came from the First World War, where the original message sent from the front line was, send reinforcements, we are going to advance. And by the time the message reached the headquarters, this turned into send three and four pence, we are going to advance. So irrespective of type and size of bridge and the amount of people in the bridge team, there will always be one person responsible for issuing heading and engine orders. In other words, the con. Next slide, please, Derek. Mark, I've lost your voice. <laughs> How far back should I go? Uh, on? Uh, just 10 seconds. <laughs> okay, I'll start at the top of this slide then. So the size and design of the wheelhouse can contribute towards improving the communication. If the person holding the con, the off of the watch, master pilot, can be provided with all this in essential information to allow him to make a informed decision the chances of communication error will be reduced this could result in the physical size of the wheelhouse being reduced providing a wide arc of visibility from the conning chair and improving visual lookout and reducing internal reflection next slide please david <clears throat> now i wanted to include a really state-of-the-art modern bridge in the publication but unfortunately it came just after the publication had been sent to the printers and therefore i'm adding this here this is the fast ferry eleanor roosevelt which came into service a week ago monday next slide please now we can see the true cockpit design of this uh, fast ferry and notice how all the instrumentation is duplicated on each side so we have the pilot co-pilot arrangement and all the controls are reachable from those chairs next slide please here is another view and you can see here where uh, either pilot or co-pilot can uh, drive the ship and he's got all the information in front and at the same time, it is possible to see the display of the other, so that if a, the range of one radar is a different one than one's own, you can glance across and see what the other um, um, pilot is doing. And similarly with the ECTIS. And grouping that information all together cuts out the communication errors, makes things live. But most importantly, by reducing the size of the, the physical size of the wheelhouse, it means that there is no uninterrupted there's no interruption to the angle of vision from what i now call the conning position so i believe this is the way forward um, for bridge watch keeping next slide thank you another view then again from another side now of course this ferry has the windows slanting downwards and we are used to the slant being the other direction. So the, my comment about internal reflection doesn't quite uh, match here, but is a lot better if the windows are slanted the other way. Next slide, David. Finally, I would like to make some uh, acknowledgements here. Um, I read an article that was written by Captain Peter Boyle, who was our president back in uh, 1993. Um, he wrote a forward to a uh, publication of a nautical briefing called Bridge Watchkeeping. And in that one, he made uh, uh, some statements which really motivated me towards achieving better results as far as navigation went. I'd like to thank Yves Vandenborn, who's been a constant source of support uh, through, throughout and especially the review team, and uh, we'll be speaking to some of the, uh, the review team later, Deirdre, Varina, and Sanji. 
and especially uh, special thanks to Balearia, who are so quick in providing me with the photographs from the Eleanor Roosevelt, which came into service just uh, one week ago. And my apologies to them for the incorrect use of the word Balearia group and forgetting the accent on our flyer. And finally, big thanks to all the members of the Nautical Institute, authors of the, our publications, Andy Norris, etc. Which have served to help me in write this publication. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely fabulous insight uh, into the way you you went about developing the book. What I'd like to do now is to invite the other panelists to uh, to come back online. And there's just something, Mark, that struck me when we were looking at those um, those photographs of the bridge. You know. We, we, we've got a history of using the word competent um, in, in the Merchant Navy. And, and really, when you look at the, the skills required and the, 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 the complexity, the sophistication of the technology, we are talking about highly skilled professionals. Um, you know, it goes way beyond just the word competent. And, and, and uh, you know, I think that this uh, really highlights the, the importance of that uh, recognition to Merchant Navy professionals uh, around the globe. So thank you for those insights and thank you uh, to, to our other speakers. Um, and, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome the other panelists, um, uh, Captain Sajith. Uh, Captain Sajith Babu, uh, Associate Fellow of the Nautical Institute, Master Mariner, uh, working as a Marine Superintendent with, with Suntec Ship Management uh, at this time. Uh, had command experience on tankers, uh, which is my uh, command experience gave him the passion for improving safety and, and developing um, practical quality s systems on board ships, but also introducing the importance of, of mentoring and the development of a safety culture amongst the uh, younger seafarers. Uh, Sajith is um, uh, on the uh, Younger Members Council of the Nautical Institute uh, and a member of the Company of Master Mariners uh, of, of India and has carried on doing postgraduate studies and so on. Um, Verena, a warm welcome to you as well, became a seafarer after graduating from business and law school, first gaining experience on board traditional sailing ships before transferring to uh, AIDA Cruises, um, sparking an interest in the whole of the ship's construction and operation. Um, um, and, and, and a move to um, a University of Applied Science and Technology um, in the Department of Maritime Studies. Um, and during her studies and, and her training, she sailed on, on cargo ships as deck cadet, uh, as well as the, uh, the usual STCW courses. Um, and last but by no means least, uh, Deirdre Lane, a fellow of the Nautical Institute, holds uh, an MSc in, in uh, shipping operations, along with a, a bachelor's degree in nautical science and a diploma in port management. Um, Deirdre was appointed uh, harbour master uh, in 2018 um, and is uh, on the Nautical Institute Council and a vice chair of the technical committee. So a very warm welcome to you. Um, listen, we've covered um, some interesting ground there and it was very interesting, um, Dominic, to, to see your analysis of some of the incidents. But at the end of the day, bridge watch keeping as well as technology is about people. Um, Cuba, we, we often hear this, uh, the issue of um, human error. Um, is, is that fair? Is, is, is it just too easy to point the, the, the finger at a person or, or is there more to it than that? Well, you know, John, my answer, obviously. Um, I would love to see that we stop uh, blaming people. We would like to tell the, the, the human being, okay, you are there as a goalkeeper and you are our last resort. Even in the case Dominic was showing, I'm thinking, okay, so the anchor failed, the ship start moving and we are blaming human being for it. Shouldn't we first start thinking why the anchor didn't hold? Was it in the right position? Was the anchor right for the ship? Was the conditions good? And so on and so forth. And then as a last resort, arrive to the human being. So. In the game, do we always blame goalkeeper when we lose the goal? Or are we asking questions, where were the defenders? Where was the middle field? Or maybe attackers should be doing something. And how about coach and so on and so forth? So yes, I think whoever is asking a question very often, yes, we just go for the last resort, which is human being, and let's blame him. Without thinking why this human being was not able to help himself and the rest, what can we do? Uh, otherwise, we will just be replacing people by one. So it won't be Cuba, it would be Dedry next time. And the anchor will fail and the vessel will sail wherever. And have we f fixed anything? 
No, far from that. Enough of me. Thank you. Well, it's an interesting insight. And if any of the panel uh, want, want to uh, chip in either with a view that agrees or disagrees, um, just just wave your hand and, and, and we'll we'll see there. It, it, it struck me when we looked at all that technology, um, training and experience is, is really important. Um, Verena, you you've been through, or you're enjoying that that sort of uh, development at the moment. What's been your experience of the amount of time that you've had on the bridge, and has that been e enough, or, or just just share with us your thoughts about that experience, please? During my studies, I had uh, 12 months of uh, bridge experience or onboard experience, and um, afterwards, I was going to school for three years. And uh, there we had about one and a half year simulator trainings. So um, in total, I would say it's enough uh, to be able to be officer. But of course, um, the simulator training will not, um, yeah, uh, will not do anything what you can learn um, on the on the ship itself and on the bridge itself. Well, uh, thank you for that, and and I'll probably come back to a question about the use of simulators uh, a, a little a little bit later on. Um, so, Keith, if I could turn to you, there's a question um, from Brian, um, and um, his his question is: Does the the modern officer of the watch um, spend enough time actually looking out of the window, or are they distracted by all this technology that's surrounding them? Uh very very realistic question actually um thanks for that uh it's it's all basically depending on uh, what you are expecting from him and what he has gained what information he has gained so if you think that uh, there is an officer who is just glued to the screen uh, maybe he is not able to give what he is expected for maybe his basics is not correct that's why he's confused and he's standing on top of the screen. This is very normal nowadays during sailing. And uh, instead of blaming uh, the, the younger generation that uh, they are on the screen, uh, it should be taken up in the training level. You know, uh, it's uh, we normally hear the words, you know, stick to your basics or, uh, you know, basics, where is your basics? So that, that's what, uh, you know, it's worth mentioning that uh, when while I was going through the book, Bridge Watch Keeping, it's very basic. It's, it, all the basics are in it, and uh, I think everyone, all all the navigation watch keepers, should go through this book because it has got all the basic level information. You know, from where you can start off very easily. You can you can reach you can climb up the steps very easily from when when you have a strong base. That's what I feel. Okay, thank you. Um, and 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 Deirdre, you know, we we've seen the bridge equipment, but there's, there have been huge developments, and, and maybe you have some uh, some commentary from your experience with, with Irish Lights about how um, the aids to navigation have, have changed and, and can support those bridge watch keeping principles. What, what would you have to say about that? <clears throat> uh, thanks, John. That's an interesting question, and I have um, a good example from my bridge watch keeping days. Um, we were guard vessel for a wreck in the English Channel, um, and we're carrying out all the usual guard vessel duties, and all the usual precautions were in place to let mariners know about the position of the wreck, uh, nav warnings, 1,000 meter exclusion zone, um, Raycon Delta, and of course, uh, the reports to the local traffic station, Joburg Traffic. So each vessel on making its traffic report um, were informed by Joe Work Traffic that there is a wreck. Are you aware of the position? Of course, everyone said, yes, yes, we're, we're aware of the position. And I as the, and my colleagues as the bridge watch keeping officers had to warn numerous vessels of the position of the wreck, even with all these precautions in place. Um, a day later, the French uh, Coast Guard used their AIS space station network to place uh, some virtual atons or virtual boys. Virtual Boy is basically um, the use of AIS to place an aid to navigation, so to place a boy, but it doesn't physically exist in the water. Uh, so myself and my bridge watch keeping colleagues immediately noticed um, a change in the behavior of the traffic. We had to m make way less calls, uh, warning of the position of the wreck. And it was back to what uh, the common thread in the book 
and what Mark discussed and what Cuba discussed, uh, language barriers, uh, communications, distractions. The virtual boys were very useful. They gave early warning of the position of the wreck. They helped alleviate those language barriers. Um, they gave clear information on the MKD unit, that's the AIS box, or on the um, the ECTUS and radar as overlay. And they were, of course, very easily deployed and removed because it was just a, a, an AIS virtual ATON. So um, that's that's an example. But just to, to, to finish by saying, uh, Mark's book is a very, very modern take on bridge watch keeping. And if you're interested in how it's all progressing, um, the final chapter covers a lovely section on future developments. Thanks. Oh, that, that, that's... That's a very, very useful uh, insight. And, and of course, though, those uh, virtual aids, um, well, you've just described the, the, their ideal placement. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and we'll probably come back a little bit later on to uh, is there anything else that the uh, ship to shore can do? Um, Dominic, you know, one of the um, one of the examples that somebody uh, sent through in, in, in a question to me is Gary uh, related to the grounding of the Ovid on, on the Varn Bank in 2013, which was um, Probably to do with um, ECDIS and the planning uh, process, but do you do you see that still happening, or, or or have we got better at those sorts of things? What, what's the experience that what you've we, had? Yeah, we, we do see obviously um, incidents which are caused by uh, overuse of uh, particularly ECDIS, but other navigational aids, AIS as well. I suppose it's difficult to assess because what we don't know is the number of uh, near misses or incidents that were avoided uh, with the use of them. But I think the, the key thing that we take away is the over-reliance upon this type of equipment. So, uh, and you know, just having your head down stuck in the ECDIS uh, takes away from the basics. And as uh, Sajid said earlier, <laughs> sometimes losing sight of the basics of lookout and uh, uh, assessing risk of collision and things like that. So it's it's it's, it's over reliance on electronic equipment that's a possible issue. Yeah, and I think uh, thank you, and, and Mark, I think you made the point about um, over reliance. On, uh, that can happen with us with an over reliance on a single source of information. Um, one of the questions that came through um, was about um, the use of the the echo sounder, um, and this was a question from from Lakshya. Um, should it be on all the time, or or, or could it help? What, what, what is your view on that, Mark? That is a really interesting question. And, and I recall back in the 1970s that somebody on a Shell VLCC left the echo sounder on, and it was thanks to that that they discovered a shoal patch of West Africa. So if I catapult that forward, I would say that if I'm traveling through an area where I've got very uh, good um, quality EMCs, I would say if you have depths of 200 meters or more, turn it off. But if you're moving into an area where you've got the U category, then turn it on, keep a record of the sound and feed it back into the hydrographic office. So, um, yes, depending on where you are and the quality of the chart that you're looking at is whether it should be on or off. Okay. Mark, thank you very much, and and, and certainly they, many can be pre-programmed with an audible alarm and so on for a minimum uh, underkill clearance and so on. Um, you know, watchkeeping. And th thank you for that, Mark. The the, the watchkeeping, Verena. Turning back to you, you, you mentioned simulators um, and and bridge watchkeeping time, and, and and I guess the balance between them is, is all, all really important. Um, bridge watchkeeping also includes um, rule of the road and, and avoiding collisions and so on. What's what's you know what, what would be your observation about the importance of real bridge watchkeeping time versus that training that you get in the simulation in the college? <laughs> Thank you. Um, at the ship, like when you're on the bridge, you have um, yeah situations uh, where ships can handle um, unexpectedly, but um, during the simulator time, the teacher uh, will create a scene which is um which has a solution and if you're even um not doing anything like if you hit the ship or something else um nothing happened so but in real cases so you might collide or yeah really damage um or yeah really can uh, do something bad and yeah the um, 
the experience on board is much more important than in the simulator, I think. I guess you've got that sense of uncertainty and ambiguity in, in the real world as to what the other person is going to do as well. And uh, so, well, listen, that's a really useful insight. And I know that the uh, the value of simulations is, and, and its contribution to skills development is something that we we, we can and we should keep un, under under constant review. Um, Cooper, it, it often comes down to um, skills and readiness and so on. Um, and people go through different training programs and so on. But how, as, as an employer, what, what, what can the manning agency or, or company do to evaluate the, the suitability of, of a crew member? Um, yes, John, 90% uh, of seafarers are nowadays employed through the crew management company. Only 10%, and the 10% is usually top two, chief uh, engineer and master, who are directly employed by owning company. So, very valid question indeed. Good managers, group crew and technical managers look after their people. They make sure that they come back. Because at the moment, our labor structure is higher and fire. So, many of us are working only and paid when we are at sea. When we are at home, we are waiting to be called back. So, good operators are making sure that the rostering is well provided to the people before they pay off they know the next assignment they are being asked very good ones are making sure the team on board is actually supplemented by other members so the team is full we don't only have experts on one particular area we've got everybody working together as a bridge team and um, I think that would be my answer. I'm thinking, what else can we do? Uh, there are different schemes, incentive schemes for people to stay, uh, avoiding changing or uh, making sure that people are not joining. That would be a disaster. So that's where the crew managers can definitely make a difference. And good companies also um, cushion situation when the owner is selling the ships or owner is pulling out of the market. If you are working for the crew manager, technical manager, then there is always opportunity to be relocated to another ship, another oper another manager owner. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I always get slightly worried when David Petraco appears on the screen. So I'm going to come to you, David, in a moment. But Sajid, you know, it seems to me that there have been a lot of developments of different technologies and so on. Um, you you work with with crews all of the time. How important um, is the period allowed for familiarization with that equipment that might be different from one vessel to the other and what's your experience of, of, of managing that <laughs> uh, this this particular aspect should be actually very uh, detailed you know it should be dealt with in detail uh, this this can be actually answered only by the onboard master or the onboard chief engineer you know um, like every every ship Will have different kind of equipment you know uh, the the major equipment in bridge watch keeping nowadays everybody gives uh, prime importance to egg because getting familiarized to a particular manufacturer of egg is uh, is a challenging task it takes time so does the watch keeping officer straight away go and take over watch you know uh, the crew change crisis and people you know join and the, the other people just go off just like that you know, it's just maybe a matter of 24 hours. So does they get, do they do they really get time to get familiarized to the equipments is a very big question. Now the answer to it, only the master mate who are there, they can only give the proper guidance. It all comes to the single word mentoring. That's, that's what I feel. If, if you have a good master, if you have a good mate, problems, half of the problems can be solved. It's very easy to blame, you know, the junior officers or the watch keeping officers for each and everything. But uh, it's it's a process. It's a process where we have to inculcate learn, learning on, on the way. It's it's just keep on, you just keep on learning and learning. That's all. I, well, I think that's a very useful um, observation. And of course, that, that onboard culture and that onboard support is is, is very important and, and, you know, some, um, some concerning remarks that um, you know around an increase in bullying with the the, the restrictions of crews on on board with COVID and so on um, creates that uh, environment which can be more difficult to manage. Um, and just one more question before I come to you, David Deirdre, you know, is, is there more that can be done um, 
do you think you know from, from your from your view um having a lot of maritime experience in, in terms of that monitoring or support from the shore to the ship you you, you were talking about the calls you were getting um but is what, what do you think is the future of that or, or you know what, how, how can we develop that line of thinking mm. Thanks, John. Yeah, I think there's a lot more that can be done. And in the COVID era where we've proven that online training can happen and that com courses can be compiled very, very quickly. So just to go back to Sajid's example about uh, new technology, I was on board when AIS was first introduced. I went on leave. There was no AIS on the bridge. I came back on board and there was this box in the bridge and I had to take out the manual and read it myself. I think the industry as a whole can do a lot better than that going forward, and particularly taking in, into account all the lessons learned from, from COVID and all the online learning opportunities that are available. Yeah, oh, well, useful insights, thank you. Uh, David. Um... Uh, sorry, John, I, um, I, I thought there might've been a problem with me seeing some of the questions coming in, but I, I, I see that you're picking them up. Uh, uh, but yeah. I'll just, I'll yeah, just ask one, uh, there's one here from Dean. Um, the OOWs uh, uh, tend to multitask between their watch keeping duties and beating the deadline for paperwork. How is the industry addressing this decades old issue? Thank you. Uh, well, who should we pick on for that? Uh, Mark, you've done navigation audits. You, you've been there um, and, and you've seen people in the workplace. Is, is that um, an observation you would agree with? <laughs> I would put in it as a major non-conformity to the manager or owner of the ship that they have allowed this to take place on the in on the bridge. And I refer to the old ships that used to have a little brass plaque across the entrance to the wheelhouse that said for use in navigating the ship, everything else off. As simple as that. I I, I cannot condone that at all. And and Kubu, would you have an observation on that sort of question? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I had to unmute. Yes, I do, because intermanager is really battling the situation with safe manning. Where the flag states are very happy for the vessel to be safe navigated with 14 on board. That's okay, navigating from A to B. But our study done in 2018 showed that a lot of seafarers, masters especially, spend very little time on the bridge something like 81%, if this is the, the, the most expensive administrator you can imagine, doing victualling, doing um, ordering, and so on and so forth. This is completely misplaced funds. Why to pay such a big money for someone who can be actually done, those tasks could be done ashore. So this is very highly on intermanager agenda, working with members, especially with the f uh, flags, to, to address this issue. Many, many conferences and seminars on this one. So, but I am not winning. I have to say, uh, you haven't seen uh, increase on say running scales going up. Having said that, tanker management self-assessment, OKIMF and the others are with us advocating for people to actually think safely. Don't go just minimum. Minimum is minimum. Be safe. That's what they advocate with. So thank you. I, I think that's a really, um, or what you were saying there is consistent with a number of remarks in, in, in the question bank, um, and that's about safe manning, minimum manning and so on, uh, and the tensions that exist um, when non-routine um, circumstances are encountered. So thank you for the people who, who've made those points. Um, and, and my apologies for the fact that we couldn't get to, to more of the questions, but I, I do value the, the insight that those questions uh, have brought to to the panel uh, and their responses for it as well. Um, today is not only a reflection on bridge watch keeping, uh, but it is also an opportunity to to recognise the, uh, the the hard work and the text that's gone into uh, creating the third edition. Uh, Mark, do you want to say some some words um, before we close about the book itself? <laughs> I just hope that this will support all the junior officers and, and officers of the watches in, in carrying out their job and, and enabling them to understand what it's all about and be um, major contributors to navigation safety. Mark, on behalf of uh, all of us at the Nautical Institute, and, and frankly, on behalf of all mariners, I would like to salute the, the work that you put into uh, developing this edition. It's, a, it's an absolutely um, really important 
game changer in terms of the information that's available to the maritime professional. Uh, thank you for your work. Thank you for your commitment. Um, and I know that this will become the key source of reference for, for mariners for, 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 for years to come. So thank you, Mark. Uh, can I also extend my thanks to uh, to the rest of the panel um, and, and for the behind the, team, uh, behind the scenes team at the Nautical Institute. Thank you to, for all of the delegates for joining us today. Uh, we wish you smooth and safe sailings uh, wherever you are and very best wishes. Thank you.